people like this for 20 years. They will get up every day, they will kill somebody and go have some chicken at KFC. Private and, and out of where our birth, uh, black folks having babies not being married and stuff like that's out of control. And it's not because they lack material things, but because not all, not all, not all, right. but most of them lack more character. Look what they did to the dome. In three days, they turned the dome into a ghetto. We got too damn many urban thugs. Yo. He is obviously telling his audience to take the law into their own hands and kill urban thugs in Atlanta. The fact that blacks are seven times more likely than people of other races to commit murder, eight times more likely. The only duty we owe to history is to rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it. Oscar Wilde. Warning. Some information once heard can never be ejected from your mind. You will either be forced to suppress it or act upon it. You are about to hear the reality of the many untold or hidden things that have taken place in this world we live in. The truth of these things are now springing forth as a flood, as if a levy of knowledge has broken free. If you are a person who despises the truth, enjoys your delusion, and rejects knowledge, Please keep it moving and don't bother to waste your time with this video because what you are about to hear will cause you to rethink everything you thought you knew. It will challenge your mind to the very edge of consciousness. So if you are not used to positive brain activity that may stimulate thought and change, get up, cut the video off and continue grazing in the grass as a lost sheep. Watch your television to keep your mind weak. Drink the Kool-Aid of darkness and go back to sleep. Shalom. As young Eliah embarks on his research, he will soon discover that everything he thought he knew about his history was all wrong. The cover-up of the accomplishments of black people. Uh, uh, Chancellor Williams wrote a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. And in this book, he outlines seven points as to why he feels that there was a cover-up. Ignore. Just refuse to publish any facts of African history that don't go along with our racial theories. We need to create a religious and a scientific doctrine so that the African slavery won't appear that bad after all. What we need to do is flood the world with new African histories that contain our European perspectives only. Start renaming people and places. Replace African names with Arabic and European names. This will disguise their true black identity. Let's change the criteria for defining race. For example, one drop of Negro blood in America makes you a Negro, no matter how light the skin. Yes, when reporting ancient African history, reverse the standard. No matter how dark the skin, woolly the hair, or thick the lips, you don't have to be a Negro. When black contribution to civilization is too obvious, let's find a way to attribute it to outside white influences. When all the ancient historians contradict your theory, we'll just discredit them. Young Eliah has just discovered that a cover-up of history is not only possible, but conceivable. There has been a conscious effort to white out the history of black people in this world. What we need to do is flood the world with new African histories that contain our European perspectives only. What we need to do is flood the world. Flood the world. Flood the world. Flood the world. Just over 100 years ago, a wandering prospector, a German by origin called Karl Mauch, searching for gold, came through these remote hills on a long trail and stumbled on this. He was the first white man ever to see it. And what he found, though he didn't know, were the largest man-made structures in any part of old Africa 
south of the valley of the Nile. A stone-built city in the heart of Africa. And yet the white people who first saw it were so blinded by their prejudices that they could not believe the evidence of their own eyes. Rather than face the possibility that Africans might have a history of their own, they fabricated exotic explanations and imagined fantastic rites in honor of faraway monarchs. The educational systems of the world have managed to convince the original peoples of the earth that they are nothing more than a worthless chance happening. You have those such as Jordan Maxwell who claim that we are some sort of primitive being that was already here before God created them. Note the implication is that they were created by God and that we evolved. The favorite claim of many is that we evolved from apes, which helps them in stating in their constitution that we are only three-fifths human. ...was the eminent writer and historian Thomas Carlyle. In 1849, Carlyle published an essay entitled Occasional Discourse on the Negro Question, in which he appealed for a return to some form of slavery. It was printed and reprinted in magazines across the world and helped transform the 19th century debate about race. Carlyle's voice is a kind of prophetic voice, you know, which booms out from his study in, in Cheney Walk in Chelsea and he writes these, you know, extraordinarily powerful prophetic pieces which were read, you know, with gusto by Victorians and they, I mean, one can imagine them all sitting around their fires reading the latest periodical that's come out with this flow of rhetoric. In this case, in the occasional discourse on the Negro question, the flow of rhetoric is about the necessity for inequality. Inequality is the proper way to run a society. Those who know should rule those who don't know. Men should rule women, white people should rule black, educated people should rule the masses. It is a common myth that the dark indigenous people of certain regions are no longer there. They are still in these lands but are strategically kept out of the media to enhance the deception. Let's talk about how Europeans colonized the whole world and dominated over the indigenous in favor of their own desires. The whitening of a culture has been going on for thousands of years. Usually, when a land is conquered by a foreign people, the entire look of the people changes over a period of years. The women of that land are raped or subjugated as sexual slaves to their new masters. Much of their original history changes and become corrupt or assumed by their conquerors. A good example of this is Australia. The indigenous people of the land were black aboriginals. But when the British came and the British took over the land, the aboriginals were killed and pushed into the desert lands. In the empire that the missionaries and abolitionists set out to create, indigenous peoples would see their cultures destroyed and their religions eradicated. And yet all this seems almost benign when compared with the grim reality of what imperialism became. Because during the 19th century, their dream was gradually overwhelmed by another vision. One that claimed that the dark races could not be civilized and should instead be exterminated. The British set about building a new capital and settling the surrounding countryside, land that for millennia had been the prime hunting ground of the Aboriginals. Out in these fields and pastures, far from the control of the authorities, the settlers were free to displace and abuse the Aboriginals. From the 1820s, huge amount of Aboriginal land has been taken up. Huge amount of Aboriginal land has been taken up. Huge amount of Aboriginal land has been taken up. And there is this enormous struggle between Aboriginal people 
and whites. Of course, it's very hard to document a lot of the settler violence because they know that it is against the law to kill Aboriginal people. They are being told that Aboriginal people are British subjects, but they certainly reveal in their diaries and journals the desire to kill Aboriginal people. What became known as the Black War was a hidden conflict. The landscape itself was the only witness. The British settlers killed any Aboriginals they encountered. Whole groups were massacred. Kidnapping and rape became commonplace. The British then began to come up with strategic ways to breeding out the original people of the land. Notice, if you will, the half-caste child and there are ever increasing numbers of them. Now, what is to happen to them? Are we to allow the creation of an unwanted third race? Should the coloreds be encouraged to go back to the black? Or should they be advanced to white status and be absorbed in the white population? Now, time and again, I am asked by some white man, if I marry this colored person, will our children be black? and as Chief Protector of Aborigines, it is my responsibility to accept or reject those marriages. Here is the answer. Three generations. Half-blood grandmother, quadroon daughter, octroon grandson. Now, as you can see, in the third generation, or third cross, no trace of native origin is apparent. The continuing infiltration of white blood finally stamps out the black color. The Aboriginal has simply been bred out. Bred out. Bred out. They did not call themselves Aboriginals. This was the name given to them by the British. Colonization brings death to the original people of the land. Names change and history is erased. Before the British in 1803, there were an estimated 750,000 full-blooded aboriginals. The last full-blooded aboriginal was a woman named Truganini who died in 1876. Another example of intentional breeding out of blacks is what occurred in Brazil. When slavery was abolished, what did the white elite think about the legacy of African culture in Brazil? Uh, what bothered them, or the biggest problem, was how to deal with the population of color. Various intellectuals believed for Brazil to become a civilized country, it had to have a process of whitening. For this reason, the government invested a great deal in European immigration to the country. The Brazilian government paid for more than 4 million Europeans to migrate to Brazil. This was part of a process known as branqueamento, whitening. The government hoped that these new immigrants would outnumber the black people and breed with them over time whitening the face of Brazil whitening the face of Brazil whitening the face of Brazil both its gene pool and its culture from then on the government began to persecute practices that were seen as black like candomblé and capoeira trying to convince people that these practices were barbaric and that it was a civilizing act to stop them. History is being changed all the time. And then the people that control things, what do they do? They suppress the truth by calling you a racist if you challenge their version of history. I find it amazing that in every continent, the indigenous people of the land are much darker than the people that reside in the land today. What most don't realize is that the original people are still in these lands, while the lighter carbon copy of these people are pushed to the forefront and the darker people are pushed in the shadows of the land.
History has left some very impressive proof and evidence of what has happened. However, there are those who have set out to cover up true history and replace it with deception to cause particular groups to be shown in a better light than what history has already played out. They've also set out to recast historical figures as a race or a culture that wasn't true to real history. Much of our history has been whitewashed to portray the white race as always being on top. And we know that this is widely not true. Let's talk about ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians, more than any other culture, have left impressive proof of who they were as a people. When you look through the walls of Egypt, you see black images, people of black or brown skin. Now we know that there are those who have set out to whitewash ancient Egypt through portraying them as white people in movies, books, and you name it, all kinds of media that has been printed and published to try to whitewash them. But the real proof is right there on the walls of Egypt, where you see black 
people. But what Europeans have attempted to do to disprove this fast photo album is to give you implausible explanations. Here are some of the ridiculous claims being made by Europeans. First, they claim that the black skin doesn't necessarily mean that they were black and that the braids, the afros, and the other Negro hairstyles were just headdresses. Some Europeans also claim that Egypt is not necessarily part of Africa. Mm, mm, mm. Another claim is that the white race used to be darker and that they only lightened up in recent times. So you see the dark images in Egypt are really just darker white people. Other claims is that whites used to portray themselves as black in ancient times. Or, or here's another one for you. Here's a doozy. The black images seen on the walls of ancient Egyptian tombs are actually the images of those whom we conquered. And they also claimed that it was common to not show themselves as white on the walls of Egypt, but to only show the images of their enemies. Now here's the last ridiculous claim being made that I'm going to give you. The black images or statues that you see are only dark because they darken over time but they were actually white, Nordic, or Celtic people. Those are just a few of the outlandish reasons why Europeans are claiming to be the ancient Egyptians. Egypt of the pharaohs was the greatest and the oldest and the most inventive of all the high civilizations of antiquity. And it flourished for 3,000 years. It set a pattern and example for peoples near and far. But where were its roots, its origins, its starting point? Most of us have believed or have been taught that the glories of the pharaohs could never have been created by African people or African ideas because, it's been said, Africans could never have built a high civilization. And I imagine that most visitors conclude as they listen to their guides that a statue such as this of the young king Tutankhamun may have turned very black in the course of centuries but could not have been a black man in the first place. It followed that the royal children were often black as well, as was King Senothret seen here wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt. Or this pharaoh of unknown name but obviously of high prestige in his time and just as clearly African. When all the ancient historians contradict your theory, we'll just discredit them. Despite these ancient images of young King Tut with clear dark brown features and African features, Europeans have completed their very own deceptive reconstruction to make him appear white. Now the Europeans also claim that King Tut's DNA traces him back to Europe. What they fail to realize in this absurdity is that the DNA of all humanity goes back to a single black African tribe, including that of Europeans. They also fail to realize that blacks have been all over this planet. So you will find African DNA in every man, woman, and child. This point was brought out in a recent scientific documentary on the National Geographic. The film was called Search for Adam. Stand how this could be. We must discover scientific Adam's lost Eden. Enter his world and look him in the eye at an unexpected crossroads of Bible and biology. We're headed on a search for Adam. Finally, Wells comes face to face with the man he's been searching for. A new portrait of the common ancestor of every man today. Adam. Without a skull, we can't know for sure what Adam looked like. But a combination of genetic evidence, Bender's forensic skills, and cutting-edge computer software 
suggest he looks something like this. Thousands of years after the Bible, and hundreds of years after Michelangelo, we have a whole new face for Adam. People living in equatorial Africa are living in a hot environment. The skin must have been able to sweat very efficiently so that people could keep cool. And also because that skin was naked and therefore was prone to damage from ultraviolet radiation. And so the skin of our ancestors was dark, full of the natural sunscreen, melanin. Even science recognizes that the first humans on Earth were black and that all other races came from them. It should be common sense that you can get white from black, but you cannot get black from white. But for those who don't understand this, let me break it down for you. It is very common for the couple on the left to be able to produce any of various shades of skin color when having children. However, the couple on the right are only able to produce children with a shade of skin color after their own kind. Here are examples of children produced by black parents. While we have many examples of the couple on the left producing children of various shades, the couple on the right can never produce a child that looks like Wesley Snipes. When the topic of Ham, the youngest son of Noah, is brought up, Europeans love to bring up the curse that was passed down by Noah. They like to use that to claim that the whole black race was cursed. You know, even that was done erroneously because Ham was not cursed, only his son Canaan was cursed. You know, they also failed to mention that Ham had four sons. He had Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And you know the land of Egypt was originally called Mizraim after the original founder. You know the son of Ham? So that clearly shows that the original progenitors of ancient Egypt were black people. Mizraim was the original Hebrew name for Egypt as recorded in Genesis 50 and 11. This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians, wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. Flavius Josephus Now all of the children of Mizraim, being eight in number, possessed the country from Gaza to Egypt. Though it retained the name of one only, the Philistim, for the Greeks called part of the country Palestine. Antiquities, Book 1, Chapter 6, Verse 2. Start renaming people and places. Replace African names with Arabic and European names. This will disguise their true black identity. A few years back, I had a co-worker that was from Egypt that spoke French. After doing some research, I discovered that French is like a second language to Arabic for most modern day Egyptians. How is it that we see these people in the land today as Egyptians when the ancient Egyptians showed themselves much darker on the walls of Egypt? There is a reason for this. In the days of Napoleon, Egypt was an Islamic country ruled by Arabs. When Napoleon conquered Egypt, he was shocked to see strong African features on the giant Egyptian statues. Count Constantine de Volnay, during a, a trip to Egypt in seven, from eight, 1783 to 1785, said this, and I quote, he says, on seeing that head, what head? The Sphinx of Giza. 
Typically Negro in all its features, I remembered the remarkable passage of Herodotus. The ancient Egyptians were true Negroes of the same type as all native-born Africans. Now, I, I, I want to ask this question. What would motivate him to say this phrase, typically Negro in all its features? Could it be perhaps this? This was a, an artist's conception, uh, Vivant Dinan, who accompanied Napoleon's army, 1798. This is his artist's conception of the Sphinx of Giza. Before what happened? Before the lips and the nose were shot off by Napoleon's troops. That is verifiable because Dinan was an eyewitness to those lips and no nose, that li the lips and noses, nose being shot off by the soldiers. Why did they do it? We cannot climb into their hearts in the 21st century and figure this out, divine the entrails of frogs and try to figure out why they did it. That's between them and, and God. But what happened, happened. And uh, so when you look at this, you know that there, <laughs> this definitely was patterned after an African man, uh, regardless of who uh, the identity of that man was. What was it? about the nose and the lips that caused the French to destroy the statues. Just look at the number of statues with the nose removed. The noses and the lips told a story about these people. A story that the Europeans did not want to hear. A story about a great civilization of black people that once ruled the world. What did the ancient Egyptians look like? Their women wore braids. What people on earth to this day are known for wearing braids? Braid salons today are a multi-million dollar business and the majority of their customers are black women. Some of these braided hairstyles are identical to the styles women wore in the days of the early Egyptians. Even some of the men's hairstyles are similar. And I doubt if I've ever seen any Caucasians wearing any of these hairstyles. Yes, when reporting ancient African history, reverse the standard. No matter how dark the skin, woolly the hair, or thick the lips, you don't have to be a Negro. Ignore. Just refuse to publish any facts of African history that don't go along with our racial theories. It is often said that color and race shouldn't matter. If that were true, why did Europeans deceptively change the images of historically black people to white? If color and race didn't matter, one must ask, why then was the history of black people whitewashed? Hollywood always cast ancient biblical characters as white. This deception programs the viewer to envision white people when reading scripture. During the Renaissance period, a huge makeover of history took place with a paintbrush and a lie. and laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen hath sought to paint the likeness of their images. For thy sanctuary is trodden down and profaned, 
and thy priests are in heaviness and brought low. 1 Maccabees chapter 3 verse 48 and 51 Today, there are only 66 books in the Bible. The late 19th century 1611 King James Version Bible, used by clergy and church members, contained 80 books. Who removed the other 14 books, known as the Apocrypha, out of the original Bible? There are several passages in the Bible that mention books not included, such as the book of Jasher. 2 Samuel chapter 1 verses 17 to 18 in the King James Version. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The book of Jasher is mentioned in the Bible, but the book itself was not included. There are actually hundreds of scriptures and transcripts that were found and not added to the Bible. This was done by the same people that changed and distorted history. Why? Did they have something to hide? The book of Enoch contains some very interesting information in which many Christians are not familiar with. Western scholars believe that the Book of the Watchers, which is contained in the Book of Enoch, date from about 300 BC, and the latest portion, the Book of Parables, was probably composed at the end of the first century BC. This pretty much validates the book. Not to mention the Tertullian, 160 to 230 CE, even called the Book of Enoch Holy Scripture. The Ethiopic Church even added the Book of Enoch to its official Bible. It is wholly extant only in the Giez language, with Aramaic fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls and a few Greek and Latin fragments. This information alone has proven the authenticity of the Book of Enoch. It's generally taught in the churches today that Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, represent three groups of people. Ham, the black man, Japheth, the white man, and Shem, everyone in between. If you look a little closer in the scriptures, you'll see that it reveals the truth about those three boys. And after some days, my son Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamech. And she became pregnant by him and bore a son. And his body was white as snow and red as the blooming of a rose. And the hair of his head and his long locks were white as wool. And his eyes beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, he lighted up the whole house like the sun. And the whole house was very bright. And thereupon he arose in the hands of the midwife, opened his mouth, and conversed with the Lord of Righteousness. And his father Lamech was afraid of him, and fled, and came to his father Methuselah. And he said unto him, I have begotten a strange son, diverse from and unlike man, and resembling the sons of the God of heaven. And his nature is different, and he is not like us. And his eyes are as the rays of the sun, and his countenance is glorious. And it seems to me that he is not sprung from me, but from the angels. And I fear that in his days a wonder may be wrought on the earth. And now, my father, I am here to petition thee, and implore thee, that thou mayest go to Enoch, our father, and learn from him the truth. For his dwelling place is amongst the angels. If a black couple has an albino child today, is that child considered black or white? We all know that they're still considered black even with the presence of white skin. This albino offspring is still capable of producing children with normal brown skin. This was the case of Noah. Noah was a black albino man with a black wife and had black children, and we will prove this. Notice how Noah's father Lamech responded to him at his birth. He responded in abject fear. He wondered why his son's skin was white. He questioned if he was the child of angels and doubted that he even belonged to him. His concern was that his son looked nothing like him or his wife. Now if Lamech himself or his wife were white, why would they be surprised at the appearance of their son? The fact that Noah had black parents gives you an indication that he himself was not a white child as in European, 
but an albino. This image is a prime example of the case of Noah, an albino dad with a black wife and three normal looking children. Albino does not equate to European. Ham, the father of Mizraim, also known as Egypt, and Shem, the father of the Hebrews, more importantly, the children of Israel, all look the same in appearance. Even Zondervan's Bible Dictionary prints the following. Ham is the father of the dark races, Africans, but not the Negroes. So then who is the father of the Negroes? Shem or Japheth? Description of the Hebrews the walls of Egypt gave a description of the people that lived there, and since the children of Israel were slaves there for more than 100 years, wouldn't there be images of the true Israelites on the walls? But how do we know what they looked like, and what did they wear? If we look closely at the scriptures, we can see with our own eyes what they must have looked like. In Amos chapter 9-7, it says, are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt? The children of Israel resembled the Ethiopians, which are actually Cushites, descendants of Ham's son Cush. Europeans refer to them as Nubians. Let's compare the description of the Israelites in the scriptures with the images of the so-called Nubians on the walls of Egypt. The Israelite men and women wore golden earrings as recorded in Exodus chapter 32, verses 2 to 3. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up, make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. The Israelite priest, which were men, wore bonnets upon their heads, a cap as hemispherical as recorded in Leviticus 8.13. And Moses brought Aaron's sons, and put coats upon them, and girded them with girdles, and put bonnets upon them, as the Lord commanded Moses. The Israelites wore fringes upon their garments, as recorded in Numbers 15.37-38. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. The Israelite priest, which were men, wore a scarlet color, red, girdle. The Hebrew word for girdle is abnate, which means a belt. Hebrew dictionary, belted, girded with. As recorded in Exodus 39.29. And a girdle of fine twined linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, of needlework, as the Lord commanded Moses. The Apostle Paul even wore a girdle, as recorded in Acts 21.11. They were a dark-skinned people. When the scriptures describe Yahshua, the one known to the world as Jesus, it mentions that he had skin like brass in the King James Bible. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. 
His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. This is what the translators want you to believe. But if you do your research, you'll see that this was not true. The actual Greek and Hebrew word means burnished copper, but the Strong's Greek translation says whiteness, which is a deceptive translation. Have you ever seen a white-looking burnt penny? What are they really trying to say? That the Messiah was white? The actual meaning was brightness, like the shine of a copper coin. Notice brass is more yellow-looking, whereas copper has a more bronze appearance. Why did white translators interpret burnished copper as the whiteness of brass instead of the brightness of brass or the shine? It's also worthy to mention that the Messiah's hair was like wool, and his feet looked as if they burned in a furnace, as recorded in Revelation 1.16. When Paul was giving instructions to Timothy about the apparel of the women, he said that the women shouldn't wear braided hair, as recorded in 1 Timothy 2.9. Black women are known to wear braids. The scripture also mentions that Samson, Solomon, the Levite priest, Samuel, and Yahshua, known to the world as Jesus, all had locks of hair on their heads. Let's first look at Joseph. His brother sold him to the Egyptians, and years later when the famine came, his brothers didn't recognize Joseph the Hebrew. He was mistaken as a natural born Egyptian, Mizraim of the seed of Ham, a black man. The Pharaoh brings Joseph out of prison to interpret his dreams. Joseph declares that the dreams portend seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of famine. Joseph recommends that the Pharaoh preserve food from the time of abundance for use during the time of famine. The Pharaoh is so impressed by Joseph's plan that he places him in charge of his entire court, a role that is memorialized on the walls of royal tombs. Egyptologist Dr. Yasser Izzat gave me a guided tour in the Valley of the Kings. This is one of the most beautiful tombs in this area. So these are all the images of the visitors? Yes, yes. As you see in everywhere here, they, shy, they showed the title of the vizier. You see the blue circle up. The circle with the dots in it. Yeah, yeah. above it, you see the sign above it. Yeah, now what is that sign? Yeah, this is Emira, means the overseer of the city. It's almost like you can draw a direct connection between these hieroglyphs on the wall and what's in this book. Yeah. If Joseph was white, he would have stood out among the Egyptians. Let's not forget, Egypt is Mizraim, the son of Ham. Moses also was mistaken for an Egyptian. Think about it. When Moses was born, Pharaoh sent orders to kill every Hebrew son that was born. But you know the story. Moses' mother put him in an ark, and Pharaoh's daughter found him and raised him as her own child right under Pharaoh's nose. Now you know if Moses did not look like the Egyptians, then Pharaoh would have killed that young boy. Moses could have actually become Pharaoh if he continued to be called the grandson of a pharaoh. The Hebrews and the Egyptians looked just alike. As a matter of fact, Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian by the daughters of the Midian priests. They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and drew water enough for us. The names were changed in the Bible to hide the true identity of the people. Had the scriptures referred to Moses said a Mizraimian or a Hamite delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, then everyone would have known that Moses was black. Paul was even mistaken as an Egyptian or a descendant of Ham. 
Another point I want to bring out is that Yahshua, the one that everyone refers to as Jesus, was not the same nationally as the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Yahshua was from the bloodline of Yehuda or Judah. When you look at the origin of the word Jew, we have Yehuda, which means Judah, pertaining to Judah. Now you know Judah, along with the other 11 tribes of Israel were in bondage in Egypt. It's recorded in the book of Exodus, the story of the Ten Commandments and how Yah delivered them from bondage of the Egyptians. Well, how is it that we have these so-called Jews in this passage saying that they were never in bondage? Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Did you get that? Did you hear that? They said they were never in bondage. Well, if they were of the seed of Jacob, they couldn't make that statement. Well, that's because they were Jewish converts. They were proselytes, Edomites, descendants of Esau. Notice that they told Yahshua that they were of the seed of Abraham. And Yahshua agreed with them. Indeed, that they were of the seed of Abraham. That's because they were descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. Herod the king was an Edomite. The Herods were an Edomite family that ruled Israel during the time of Yahshua's earthly ministry. The Jewish council, called the Sanhedrin, was under the authority of the Herods, who were in turn under the authority of the Roman Emperor. Therefore, at the time of Yahshua, Edomites were throughout the land of Israel and ruling the true Israelites, which were black. In the land of Israel, we have proselytes claiming to be Jews. Why is the history of Jacob and Esau so important? Well, when you consider the fact that prophecy says that Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of that which follows, you can then see why it is important for us to understand the history of these two brothers. Let's start at the beginning. Why was Esau described in Scripture but not his brother Jacob? Scripture actually talks about how the Most High spoke to Rebekah and said to her that there would be two nations separated from her womb. Two manner of people, or should I say, two different kinds of people. Esau looked distinctly different from the rest of his family and this is why he was described and not Jacob. Jacob looked like the rest of the ancient Israelites in appearance, which was dark with woolly hair, hair like a lamb. But Esau's hair was red and must have been straight since Jacob used the skins of a kid goat and not the skin of a lamb. Notice how our Savior Yahshua the Messiah is described as a lamb and having hair like lamb's wool. And we know he was of the tribe of Yehuda, a true Jew. Esau being Jacob's brother but looking very different is something that you will need to pay close attention to to find out who Esau is today. Esau Revealed in Scripture Edom was also translated as Idumea in certain scriptures. Edom, from Hebrew word Adam meaning red, is the elder twin brother of Jacob, hence the region occupied by him, Edom, Edomites, Idumea. 
This is the prophecy concerning Esau from Isaac. Esau is only promised to dwell in the fatness of the earth. Esau is only promised to dwell in the dew of heaven. Esau will live by the sword to gain his resources. So basically, Esau was promised nothing tangible, but by the sword, he's going to live and dwell in the best places of the earth. Through war and conquest, Esau has dominated the world and has subjugated many nations. These were dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz, Duke Korah, Duke Gatam, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. Dukes. Why did it call them dukes? The Hebrew word for duke is aluf, meaning a chieftain or captain, a governor. Governor as in local government. For years, historians have taught that local government started in Rome and worked its way to the Americas. But as many are finding out, Edomites, the descendants of Esau, actually made up the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, the Jewish Encyclopedia also states that the name Edom is used by the Talmudists for the Roman Empire, and they applied to Rome every passage of the Bible referring to Edom or to Esau. Where is Edom today? Esau's land was called Edom. Edom is the country of Jordan and the place of Petra, the city in the mountain. Look at the architecture of the photo at Petra, which is Edom. Notice how it resembles Rome along with many of the structures all over the world. Our sports stadiums resemble the Colosseum. Even modern day sports are in fact derived from Rome. European systems of government are set up like the early Roman Empire having both Senate and the Republic, local government, and other things as well. Esau's descendants are called Edomites. Later, they're called Idumeans. Idumea or Edom in Hebrew was the region south of Judea, originally inhabited by the reputed descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. Edom was periodically subjected to Judea under David and Solomon the Maccabees, homeland of the House of Herod. There were no natural boundaries between Idumea and Judea, so the borders were always in flux. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, 1925 edition, in 163 BC, Judas Maccabeus conquered the Edomite territory for a time. They, the Edomites, were again subdued by John Hyrcanus, about 125 BC, by whom they were forced to observe Israelite rites and laws of the Torah. They were then incorporated with the tribe of Judah, and their country was called by the Greeks and Romans, Idumea. With Antipater the Idumean began the Idumean dynasty that ruled over Judea its conquest by the Romans. From this time, the Idumeans ceased to be a separate people. Therefore, Edom later became known as the Roman Empire. With the sacking of Rome by the barbarians came the mingling or spoiling of Esau's seed, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah 49.10. But I have made Esau bear. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. Also, in Daniel 2.43, the iron referring to the fourth kingdom of Rome, Esau's seed was mingled and spoiled with the seed of the children of the fallen angels. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces, and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. 
but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. When scriptures say, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, they represents the seed of fallen angels, which are the barbarians. The barbarians that descended from fallen angels were known as, the Huns were hungry. The Roman Empire comes under siege by barbarians. Their principal weapon is fear, and they wield it with a fury. They are the Huns, but the Huns will stamp their indelible mark on history, unleashing dark powers that will open the world to a new order. The 6th century Gothic historian Jordanes tells us the Huns descended from evil spirits amid the swamps. They seemed to appear out of nowhere um, and take what they wanted and then ride off again. Um, so they were like storms coming over the horizon. You couldn't predict the weather. You couldn't predict where the Huns would come or what they would do to you. The Goths were Ukraine, Romania, Moldova, Belarus, Poland, and Scandinavia. The Saxons were Germany, the Dutch, the English, Northern Albania, Great Britain, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. The Franks were France. The Lombards were Italy. The Vandals were East Germany, which were known for their senseless destruction, which is where we get the term Vandalism. Vandalism is the behavior attributed originally to the Vandals by the Romans in respect of culture, ruthless destruction or spoiling of anything beautiful or venerable. These kingdoms all branched off into other kingdoms such as Canada, America, Caucasus, Siberia, Central Asia, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Ireland, and maybe others. No, together these kingdoms all make up the rule of the entire world. Esau and his kingdoms, Edom, will be ruling at the end of the world, and Jacob will rule afterward in the millennium under the Messiah, Yeshua. Many Bible scholars teach that the Edomites no longer exist, but scripture clearly shows them in the last days. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation for ever. Many people use this scripture to claim that Edom was exterminated, but this is not what the passage implies. It states very clearly that the Most High hated Esau and laid his mountains and heritage to waste. But in the next verse, it states, Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. At the time of Malachi's prophecy, Edom was a wasteland between 445 and 432 BC. How do we know this? The Most High said, I laid, past tense, his mountains and his heritage to waste. Edom's response was, we will return and build the desolate places. So if Edom was completely destroyed, how could they say that they'd return? And why would scripture give reference to Edom still being around in the last days? The Most High's response was, they shall build, but I will throw down. This is a future prophecy that Edom will return and rebuild, but the Most High will destroy his kingdom in his final judgment against Edom in the last days. For Esau, Edom is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. 2nd Esdras chapter 6 verse 9, the Apocrypha. The prophecy in Isaiah chapter 63 verses 1 through 6 confirms that this is indeed what will happen. Who is this that cometh from Edom, with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, 
traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Happen. When the Messiah returns, where does he go, and what does he do? He goes to every place where the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, have set up their kingdoms and slaughters them for their perpetual violence against Jacob. He treads the winepress and his wrath is accomplished. Further proof is in the book of Daniel, which states that in the future, the stone will smite the feet of the image that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. It is Rome that gets smitten. The Messiah Yeshua comes back and he smites modern Rome, Edom. Why are most people in denial about Esau or Edom? Many of his offspring today have read of his future judgment and deny that they are of his seed. Those that are not of his seed sympathize and have joined ranks with them. Edom is nothing more than a modern day Roman Empire which have spread over the entire earth. One key prophecy we want to bring out is in Ezekiel 36, 4-5. Edomia is Edom. And what do they do in the last days? They take the Holy Land. And this is exactly what Esau's descendants, the Edomites or Idumeans, did on May 14, 1948. Masquerading themselves as the Jews, they took the Holy Land and claimed it as their own. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumea, which have appointed my land into their possession, with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. Prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel, and say unto the mountains, and to the hills, to the rivers, and to the valleys, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because ye have borne the shame of the heathen. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I have lifted up mine hand, surely the heathen that are about you, they shall bear their shame. Are your Bible notes scattered and lack any real order? Do you have a difficult time thumbing through old notes and spending hours trying to find studies that you've done months or maybe years ago? Well, there's a solution. TABS, which stands for Thoroughly Arranged Bible Study, or Torah and Beyond Searching, is a Bible workbook that will help you organize existing Bible study notes or start from scratch with new studies. This workbook is packed with great ways of logging your studies in a chronological way to help organize your notes into an easy-to-read, easy-to-follow format. With the self-arranged table of contents, you can log your studies by page as you complete a study on a particular subject. This allows you to go back to that study without the painstaking task of trying to locate it. You are the creator of the table of contents, so you will be able to easily find your study notes without hesitation. Also included are a fasting and prayer log to help you plan and record your results. To order your TABS workbook, visit us at www.torahandbeyond.com. Are modern Jews descendants of the tribe of Judah, one of the sons of Jacob? Are European Jews really Gentiles whose ancestors converted to Judaism? The facts are clear now, that most of those who call themselves Jews are not descendants of Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, and therefore have no claim to the land of Palestine. The October 29, 1996 New York Times, in an article entitled, Scholars Debate Origins of Yiddish and the Migrations of Jews, states, The Eastern European Jews were not really Semitic, that they were largely descended from the Turkish Khazars, who converted to Judaism in medieval times. Therefore, modern Jews have no blood link to the Biblical Israelites. 
Jewish historians have established that at least 90% of all Jews come from a Turkish mix of people and are largely sourced from the Khazar Kingdom. The Jewish scholar Arthur Colster provided overwhelming evidence in his book titled The Thirteenth Tribe, showing that in the 8th century, Khazaria, which was greatly made up of the Turkish mixed people known as Khazars, converted to their national religion of Judaism, which was based on the Babylonian Talmud. He states in his book that the Khazar Empire, which in the Dark Ages became converted to Judaism, Khazaria was finally destroyed by Genghis Khan and its Mongol hordes, but evidence indicates that the Khazars themselves migrated to Poland and formed a Western Jewish community. They eventually migrated to other places like Germany and Russia. Christian churches and the general public have been deceived. Many Jewish historians are now admitting that they are not the true Hebrews of the Bible. And how can they be returning to the land of Israel when they were never there to begin with? The goal of creating a homeland for Jews seemed like a noble pursuit in 1897 when the Zionist movement became officially established. However, their dream of returning to Palestine has become a nightmare of violence and there is no end in sight. Worse yet, the concept that Palestine is their homeland has turned out to be a tragic mistake. These white-skinned Ashkenazi Jews are not descendants of the original Jews of Palestine. There were no white people in Africa or Palestine 2,000 years ago. The medieval Europeans assumed that Jesus Christ, his mother, and the other original Jews looked just like the Europeans which is why you can find Jesus with blue eyes and green eyes and why his mother has such white skin. Hey guys, the gig is up. I'm not the real Jesus. As a matter of fact, the fella's name wasn't even Jesus. He had a Hebrew name. There wasn't a letter J until a few hundred years ago. <laughs> with that being said, I have fooled the whole world into the biggest sham of all time. The name and identity of the real fella has been taken over by me. <laughs> there are thousands of paintings of Jesus and they don't even come close. Jesus was the creation of the Roman Catholic Church, which served to replace the real fella who probably looked more like Morgan Freeman. <laughs> but who cares? The truth doesn't matter. As long as you pay your tithes. <laughs> gotcha. In 1976, Random House published a book that should have hit Christians like a storm, but instead, they chose to ignore it. It dealt with the racial origin of the people calling themselves Jews, and whom the churches and the Jews themselves generally insist are God's chosen people. Since the late 1800s, a number of Bible scholars who were also students of history have insisted the church denominations were wrong, that instead of being Israelites, these Jews from Eastern Europe descended from Mongolians that were actually Turkish people who had adopted Judaism as their religion over 1,000 years ago and had become known as Jews. These Bible scholars were ignored or condemned and often called cultists or anti-Semites. The 13th tribe proves beyond doubt that modern Jews are not biblical Israelites. Every church member in America should insist that their pastor investigate these claims. Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, assembled a staff of experts to research the origin of European Jews who had been entering America in large numbers since the 1880s. Ford's research cost him several millions of dollars, and in 1923, he published the results in a four-volume work titled The International Jew. It was Henry Ford's conclusion that the Jews were not descendants of the biblical Israelites. Ford further proved that these Jews committing all sorts of crimes while under the cover of being called chosen people of the Bible were rapidly taking economic and political control of America. Henry Ford also claimed that the Jews had secretly gained control of most Protestant seminaries and Christian book publishing houses and had been able to remove almost all criticism of Jews from Christian literature. In summing up his findings, Henry Ford stated, the Jews are not the chosen people though practically the entire church has succumbed to the propaganda which declares them to be so. Ford's book caused a major uproar for a few years, but soon disappeared from colleges, universities, and public libraries and became unobtainable at any price. The churches continued to teach the lie that the Jews are God's chosen people, the children of Israel. 
Jewish-dominated news media began to refer to Jews always as Israelites. Anyone opposing the Jewish control of the nations was immediately branded anti-Semitic. And Jewish-dominated seminaries taught new ministers to quote Genesis 12, verse 1 through 3, and sternly warned their flocks that anyone speaking unfavorably of the Jews would be cursed by God. Jewish control of American society, politics, and religions continued to increase. In 1951, retired U.S. military intelligence officer Colonel John Beatty published a scholarly book titled Iron Curtain Over America. Colonel Beatty gave overwhelming evidence that the Eastern European Jews were actually Khazars and had no racial ancestry in Israel at all. In Colonel Beatty's book, he states that by 1951, these Jews had a stronghold on American politics, on banking and credit, on all sources of news, on the entertainment industry, on America's education system, and that they were the predominant race as judges, lawyers, doctors, and organized crime. The Jewish news media refused to review the book. Jewish book dealers refused to handle it. Christian bookstores ignored it, and only a few thousand copies were distributed. Most Americans never heard of Iron Curtain over America. Now, because of renewed interest, both are now obtainable. Jewish gangsters getting rich off running illegal liquor across the Detroit River from Canada. They were legends in the criminal underworld of America and their name rang bells from St. Louis to New York. They also killed 500 people according to the police. Al Capone sent for them to help him murder six people in the infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre. In 1925 alone, police recovered 53 dead bodies from the Detroit River. The Purple Gang was never a tightly organized criminal syndicate, but a loose confederation of predominantly Jewish gangsters, more like modern African-American criminal groups than the Italian Mafia. The last vestiges of the Purple Gang were finished when Harry Millman, feared Purple Gang assassin, was himself shot down at Boski's Deli, November 25, 1937, on the corner of 12th Street and Hazelwood. In 1977, Colonel Curtis B. Dahl published a book titled Israel's Five Trillion Dollar Secret. He was the former son-in-law of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and a personal acquaintance of many high officials in the U.S. government since the 1930s. Colonel Dahl proves again, from reliable sources, that the Jews are not Israelites. In fact, Colonel Dahl calls their masquerades as Israel the greatest hoax of the last centuries. It should be read by every non-Jew. Now, what are the facts? The Jews, I call them Jews to you because they're known as Jews. I don't call them Jews. I refer to them as so-called Jews because I know what they are. Especially, our Lord and Savior was not one of them. And I can prove that. Now, what happened? The Eastern European Jews, who form 92% of the world population of those people who call themselves Jews, were originally Hazar. They were a warlike tribe that lived deep in the heart of Asia. And they were so warlike that even the Asiatics drove them out of Asia into Eastern Europe. There's a scripture in the Bible that most scholars skip over. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. I know the blasphemy of them that say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. The Bible scholars would have you believe that in 95 AD, there were individuals calling themselves Jews in order to join the church at Smyrna. But notice, the Jews met in a synagogue. They did not need to join the church of Smyrna. If the Jews who created the state of Israel in 1948 were not the true Israelites of the Bible, but Gentiles whose ancestors converted to Judaism, then wouldn't it be true to say that this so-called regathering of Israelites is but one big lie? And that the true Israelites, God's people, have not yet returned in these last days? Because those Jews 
have only assumed the identity of the true Israelites. Many Arabs today are aware that these are imposters that dwell in the land and they want them out of Israel. Any comments on Israel? We're arresting everybody today. Any comments Tell them on to Israel? get the hell out of Palestine. Ooh. <laughs> Any better comments? <laughs> Remember, these people are occupied and it's their land, not German, it's not Poland. So where should they go? What should they do? They go home. Where's the home? Poland. So the Jews, Germany. Do you think Jews go back to Poland and Germany? And, and America and everywhere else. This is why Jamal Abdul Nazar, the former president of the United Arab Republic, said in 1956 that he could not respect the Jews because they left Israel black and came back white. What are they? They are the synagogue of Satan. Christians don't recognize this because they are deceived. They are sending millions of dollars over to Israel each year thinking that they are helping God's people, but instead they are funding the synagogue of Satan. Christian churches and the general public have been deceived. Jewish historians are now coming forth stating that they are not the true people of the Bible and how can they be returning when they were never there to begin with? The scriptures make it clear that the true Israelites would not be back in their land until the Messiah returns. Have you seen the Messiah walking around here lately? Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. The scripture also explains that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And to Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. My question to you is this. When did the so-called Jews that we see in the land today get led away as slaves into all nations? Captive means slaves. When were the Jews today led as slaves into all nations? This never happened to the so-called Jews. The so-called Jewish Holocaust was not a slavery. As a matter of fact, other people died in the war, including blacks, Germans, those that were handicapped and mentally ill. There are huge questions surrounding the six million figure of people that were killed in the Holocaust that's been thrown down for decades. That's another subject that needs to be researched. Research the truth about the Holocaust and you will definitely begin to question what you thought you knew. Now I got another question for you. Didn't these so-called Jews reject the Messiah? So as a whole, the Jews do not accept Yahshua, the one that the world called Jesus, as the Messiah. And according to the scriptures, the curses of Deuteronomy 28 should be evident in their lives. But instead, they are the richest, most powerful people on the face of the earth. I leave you with this scripture. I know thy works, tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Who call themselves Jews? Who worship in the synagogue? I rest my case.
Hey, did you know that Pope Alexander VI commissioned Leonardo da Vinci to reinvent Jesus in the image of his own beloved son, Cesare Borgia? He felt that the Vatican needed a makeover because the real fella wasn't too appealing to the general public. So, voila, here I am, the modern version of the fake Jesus. <laughs> Got you again. Where are the lost tribes of Israel today? The lost tribes of Israel are not in Israel today. Those in Israel are Jewish people who practice Judaism, which is a religion, not a bloodline. They are not the children of Jacob, which are the twelve tribes of Israel. They have claimed the heritage of a people that is not their own. They have no claims to the promises made to the biblical Israelites. There will be no peace in the land of Israel until the Messiah, Yahshua, returns and reigns with the true Israelites. As long as the land of Israel is trodden down by Gentiles, which are the so-called Jews, along with the Palestinians, and compassed about with armies, there will be no real peace. There is a clear distinction in Jews and Israelites. It must be understood that the term Jew is a modern term for a modern people, and in no way should be taken to represent the ancient people of the Bible. Publishers today will usually use the term Jew where it should state Israelites, and this is done deceptively to connect these modern people to an ancient heritage that is not their own. In order to find out where the lost tribes of Israel are today, we need to first return to the past. According to history, in the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. For over 100 years, the Israelites continued dwelling and practicing their customs while under the rule of the Roman Empire. By the time the Messiah had begun to preach, the Israelites had become weary of their Roman leaders. Even Herod, the Edomite king of Jerusalem, had to answer to Pontius Pilate who was a Roman governor under the emperor of Tiberius. After the resurrection, just before the Messiah ascended to heaven, the apostles had a very important question to ask him. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. The apostles were concerned about the fact that Jerusalem was still under Gentile rulership, and since the Messiah had declared that all power was given unto him, they wanted to know if it was time for them to take the kingdom. Restoring Greek means to reconstitute, which means to re-establish Jerusalem to the glorified position as if it were under the rule of King David. At the time of Yahshua the Messiah, the land of Israel, was a part of the Roman Empire. South of Israel was Idumea and Edom. The king of Jerusalem was a Hebrew Edomite by the name of Herod. You know him as Herod the Great. He was responsible for murdering thousands of Hebrew Israelite babies during the birth of Yahshua. The land was full of Israelites that remembered the horror that this Edomite king had done in killing their kids. They longed to get revenge for their massacred babies. They wanted the Messiah to come back and kill this Edomite king. And they also wanted the Messiah to destroy the Roman Empire that ruled over them. Herod knew this. Herod knew that the Messiah, when he came, would overthrow his rulership. And this is why he killed all the firstborn. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. 
that the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. The apostles were no doubt familiar with the scriptures in Daniel where it talked about the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Listen to what Yahshua told his disciples. And he said unto them, When I sent you without a purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Wait a minute. Yahshua told Peter that it's time to get a sword? <laughs> Let, let's bring that in today's time. A sword is a weapon for battle. In today's time, it would be a gun. So that was like Yahshua telling Peter, Go get a couple of guns. We just might need them. <laughs> this is why the disciples were expecting the restoration or the reestablishing of Israel. They were ready to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. Get this Edomite king out of his rule. But guess what? Another 70 years would go by. And not only did they have to suffer worse, but they had to be killed and even subject to slavery. In 1969, a historian and major of Hebrew Aramaic studies, Dr. Rudolf R. Windsor, wrote a book titled From Babylon to Timbuktu. In his book, Dr. Windsor gives an account of the scattering of the Israelites. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter. During the period of the military governors of Palestine, many outrageous and horrific atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the period of Pompey to Julius, it had been estimated that over one million Israelites fled into Africa, fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery. Millions of Israelites who escaped the persecution of the Roman Jewish War fled into the interiors of Africa. You've got to ask yourself, why did the Israelites run to Africa? The same reason why the parents of the Messiah fled to Egypt, to blend in. They were black and needed to blend in with other dark-skinned people. Rudolf R. Windsor, in his book Babylon to Timbuktu, points out, the black Jews who migrated to the Sudan from the north converged with the black Jews migrating from the eastern Sudan to the countries of the Niger River. There is much proof, and still much more to be revealed by scholars, that there existed prior to the slave trade and subsequent to it many tribes, colonies, and kingdoms in West Africa. Page 120. 1600 years later, their descendants were rounded up and captured by African and the Arabs slave traders and sold to the Europeans, fulfilling the curses that were written in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Moses forewarned the children of Israel of the curses that would befall them if they did not follow the commandments of the Most High. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, 
and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even! And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning! For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. The particular curses that would befall the children of Israel for not keeping the commandments of the Most High is that they would suffer slavery similar to the type of slavery they suffered in Egypt, and that they would be transported into this new slavery on ships, and that the places where they would be transported, they'd be sold as slaves to their enemies. In Deuteronomy 28.68, it says this, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. This is one of the links between the true Israelites of the Bible and the transatlantic slave trade. It explains how the Israelites fled into the interiors of Africa as refugees after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. More than 1500 years later they were rounded up on the African continent and shipped all over the western hemisphere to be sold as slaves. This is the history that has been omitted from the pages of the European history. You know, the scripture clearly states in several places where the children of Israel would be in the world. They're all over the world. They were sold as slaves to many nations. And you know, it also says that in the last days that they would still be in the land of their captivity and in the land of their enemies. And it also goes on to talk about what their lives would be like in the land of their enemies. Baruch chapter 4 verse 6 and 15. Ye were sold to the nations not for your destruction, but because you moved God to wrath, you were delivered unto the enemies. For he hath brought a nation upon them from far, a shameless nation, and of a strange language, who neither reverenced old man nor pitied child. This was obviously a future prophecy against the children of Israel because at the time that this was written, the transatlantic slave trade had not happened yet. And so all of these nations that they were sold to would have been considered far and having a strange language. You know, the scripture talks about how this treacherous, ruthless nation that we were going to be sold to wouldn't have any regards for the old or the young. A lot of you may not know this, but our children were used as gator bait. You may have heard that term before. Gator bait is referencing how the slave master would take our children, tie ropes around them, and use their bodies to catch alligators. Now that is some evil stuff right there. Over the years, I've been collecting artifacts. As a matter of fact, I've been collecting little pencils like this. I've been, I've seen uh, alligators uh, on jars. I've seen alligator ashtrays, and I've seen them depicted with kids in it. And I was wondering why the children would be there. As a matter of fact, this particular pencil sharpener. This is a pencil sharpener or a pencil holder with a kid, uh, a black head of a baby sitting out of the out of its mouth. I didn't pay any attention. I have a been collecting for quite a few few years and I have the uh, uh, the posters and things like that about different things and then one day I was down in Florida I'd gone down with my wife and I took a trip for myself off to the wild blue yonder going out to hunt artifacts and in my quest to hunt artifacts I came upon a pawn shop in, Sa in Sanford Florida in the pawn shop was a gentleman who owned it they went and got him and told him I was there and I wanted to buy some of the shackles he had hanging around the walls I asked him, to, uh, could I buy them? He said no. He didn't want to sell anything. He just wanted me to see it. Then we began to talk. Uh, and I asked him, I said, look, please let me buy something. I got to take something from here. 
He says, no. He says, uh, I don't want to sell anything. He said, but uh, I'm going to the back and I'll sit down. Meanwhile, he came out and uh, came back out. He began to talk to me. He said, you know, he said, you probably don't know this. He said, but uh, years ago, he said, my great grandfather, my grandfather before he died, told me of the things they would do. He said he would go down. He said his grandfather said they would go down and they would take babies with them. I said, what do you mean babies? He says, well, let me tell you. He said the slave babies, the slaves who had babies, they would steal the babies during the course of the day, sometimes when the mothers weren't washing. I said, what do you mean babies? I said, you mean babies like five or six years old? He says, no. These babies, some would be infants, some would be a year old. He said, some would be toddlers. He said, they would grab these children and take them down to the, the swamp and leave them in pens like little chicken coops. They would go down there at night take these babies and tie them up because they hunted the big bull alligators. These big bull alligators were not raised on farms. They were in the wild. These alligators would weigh six, seven, eight hundred pounds. Those are the ones they wanted. They would skin them, make the wallets, get the meat, do different things with them. He said, but what they were doing was tie them up, put a rope around their neck and around their torso, around here, and tie it tight. He said, the baby, I said, well, what would the babies be doing? He said, well, my grandfather said they'd be screaming. He said, what would you do? He said, just let them scream. He said, what they would do, he would help them to chum the water. He said, when they would throw the babies in tied to this rope, he said, in a matter of minutes, he said, the alligators were on them. He said, the alligators would clamp his jaws on that child. Swat, as a matter of fact, once he clamped on them, he was really swallowed. He was, you couldn't see anything but the rope. And we would pull the alligator in and tie his nose and hit him in the head with an axe, a pickaxe. He said we would then drag him to the shore. We'd drag him to the shore and leave him lay and we would do it again, maybe two or three times a night. He said, I said, so what do you mean? He said, well, yeah, they were taking these babies and killing them for alligator bait. I said, so all these things I've been collecting, all these things I've been collecting are really, really something that I can really talk about and say they're of a truth. By what you say, he said, I'm telling you, he said, nobody wants to talk about it. He said, I'm only telling you because you're here. I may never hear from you again. He said, but these things actually depict the acts that they did to slave babies back in the Bayou country and down the south. They did this. They hunted alligators with these babies. That's why they call alligator babies. You know, during slavery, oftentimes the children were separated from their parents. Our young girls would be sold to these oversexed men who would use their little bodies as sperm dumps, and they would be forced to give birth to a compromised offspring. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. One of the most shameful things that happened to us during slavery was when the slave master would come and take a wife from her husband and rape her. And prior to doing that, he would tell this man, boy, she better act like she like it. And if she just lay there as if she don't like it, I'm going to beat the hell out of you and her. Now that is a shameless person right there. A shameless person. Because we were disobedient to the laws of the Most High, we fell by the sword and was delivered into the hands of our enemies. Who was Jacob's enemy? Who was Israel's enemy? And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it. And say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. 
because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword, in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Israelite's enemy in the past has been Esau, Edom. Since the time Esau sold his birthright, who then is Mount Seir? Edom. Esau's hatred against the true Israelites has been so great until God has pronounced judgment upon him. Read it for yourself in the scriptures. He has pronounced judgment upon Edom. And to this day, the Edomites have a hate for the true descendants of Jacob. Psalm 83, a song or psalm of Asaph. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom, and the Ishmaelites, of Moab, and the Hagarenes, Gebel and Ammon, and Amalek, the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them. They have hopen the children of Lot, Selah. According to this passage, Israel's enemy in the last days will come together and cut them off from being a people and they would no longer remember that their forefather was Israel. This does not fit the description of the Jews today. But the Negro that was sold by the way of slave ships all over the world was completely robbed of his heritage. They were not allowed to remember their names, to keep their names, to remember their language, or to hold anything to their past. They are the true descendants of Israel, but they no longer remember that they are. Who are the nations that took crafty counsel against them? Look at the scripture. Who are the nations? Look at the names of these nations. It names Edom, which is raw, the Europeans, Ishmaelites, Arab nations, Gebel, a region of Edom, Rome again, Amalek, a descendant of Esau, which is also Edom and Rome. The Philistines was a region of Syria, and the Hagarite was a member of certain Arabian clans. So basically, it's the Edomites of Rome and the Arabs of the Middle East. This is a clear prophecy about the Arab slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. According to this scripture, Israel would not know their master, nor his master's crib. This has reference to do with them not knowing who they are or who their father is. The crib in Hebrew means a manger or a stall. In the case of the Hebrew Israelites, it's Israel. The so-called Jews, this isn't the case for them. They believe that they're the Jews. It's us that don't believe that we are the true people, the true Hebrews of the Bible. It's us that do not know our father's real name. They are clueless and have completely lost their heritage. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever think about it. As soon as the slaves were sold, the masters changed their names, stopped them from speaking their native language, 
forbade them from learning how to read. This was all done to totally strip them of their heritage. Isn't this the same thing that happened to the Israelites in the scriptures? In the book of Daniel, the children of Israel was taken into captivity or slavery in Babylon under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. The children known as Daniel, Hananiah, Michael, and Azariah, names were all changed to what? Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? <laughs> that wasn't their real names. They changed their names. Why did they change their names? Because their names praised the Most High. Their names gave praise to the Most High. And they said, no, you ain't gonna, we, you are slaves, you ain't gonna be praising your God in our land if you're our slaves. Mm -mm, you're gonna praise our gods. That's what Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. That's why the three Hebrew boys were thrown into the, into the um, fiery furnace. Because they didn't want to worship the other gods. They were the tribe of Judah. The same tribe that the scripture states would be in the land of captivity just before the battle of Armageddon. For behold in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and departed my land. It has been estimated that more than 100 million Africans were taken as slaves during the transatlantic slave trade. These so-called Jews had a huge role in the transatlantic slave trade. When Columbus sailed to the Americas, he was accompanied by five Muranos, modern Jews. Gabriel Sanchez, abetted by the other four Jews, sold Columbus on the idea of slavery. Once the early so-called Jews settled in America, they set up the Jewish Newport World Center of Slave Commerce. The slave industry took off. The so-called Jews owned the slave ships that shipped the Negro across the world. They even manned the ships. When the so-called Jews sailed to Africa, they discovered true Israelite Hebrews living in a very large communities in Nigeria, Ghana, and other West African nations. What better way to steal a people's identity than to exploit them and sell them into captivity? Slavery. In a way, Lieutenant, they are the ultimate victims of recent history. If you'll favor my comparison, they are the wandering Jews of Africa. Fleeing the Pharaoh Shaka, they are the wandering Jews of Africa. Fleeing the Pharaoh Shaka, they are the wandering Jews of Africa. Fleeing the Pharaoh Shaka. Into the Babylonian captivity of slavery. To this day, several tribes still consider themselves descendant from the true Israelites of the Bible, including the Ibu of Nigeria, Tutsis of East Africa, the Bemalikis of Cameroon, African tribes in Ghana, Mali, Uganda, South Africa, and the Lemba tribe of Zimbabwe. The Lemba tribe, very possibly one of the lost scattered tribes of Israel are located in remote communities in the heart of Zimbabwe. It is estimated that there may be as many as 400,000 of these ancient descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oral tradition claims that their ancestors fled the Holy Land over 2,500 years ago. We know from recent DNA testing that many are Kohanim, or descendants of Aaron, the priest, the brother of Moses. They observe many biblical Jewish customs, like the dietary laws, the blowing of shofars, and circumcision. Today, they live in abject poverty. Most have never even seen a doctor or dentist. From deep inside Africa, a sound is emanating that is causing reverberations around the world. A 
sound of a people casting off two centuries of colonialism, returning to what they say are their native roots. I know from birth I'm a Jew. Only I know that my forefather missed the way. I grew up alongside every other Igbo youth. We kept on hearing that Igbo people came from Israel. There was a story my mom told me at the age of six years. I never forget. He said, the Igbos are Jews. And it's a story of one man, Shmuel, who went searching for what that meant and found answers on the internet, prompting a journey that led him to a community of thousands of Jews. A place where resources are few, but commitment transcends. Through prayer, practice, ritual, diet, and song. But this is also the sound of doubt from Jews in America. They would ask me, are you from America? Or I would say, no, I'm a Nigerian. They say, you black. I said, yes. They said, no, it's not true. And rejection from family and friends. I am like an outcast among them. And in this volatile Christian Muslim nation, doubt often turns to violence. This is the story of the Igbo. 25 million strong. A people once under siege by their very own government. Biafra declared its independence. And a people once captured and shipped across the Atlantic by the hundreds of thousands. A people who helped build America. And a people whose descendants are now discovering their Igbo roots. Raising questions of cultural identity for countless African Americans. Many African Americans actually do not know that they have Igbo heritage, the chances of them. And just thinking about the hundreds of people, the thousands of people really, whose lives are going to be changed because of these Jewish people embracing Yeshua, coming to Yeshua as their Messiah and being built up, being educated, being restored. The tribe of Judah are the black Negroes that are shipped to North and South America, Haiti, Cuba, Mexico, Jamaica, Portugal, Spain, West Indies, and England. Even though the indigenous people of some of these areas were black, they were conquered by Europeans, and because of the mixing and mingling of the seed between European males and the black indigenous women, what you see today is essentially the creation of a third race. When we were children, we were told that we have a motherland. And that motherland was Spain. However, we have discovered later in our lives that as a matter of fact, we have several motherlands and one of the greatest motherlands of all is no doubt Africa. We love Africa and every day we are much more aware of the roots we have in Africa. Also America is our motherland. Africa, America, and Bolivar used to say that we are a new human race in Latin America. That we are not Europeans, nor Africans, or North Americans. That we are a mixture of all those races. And there is no doubt that Africa resounds with a pulse like a thousand drums. Many of the descendants of the Negroes shipped in slavery to these places are still there and they are still black. However, the image is widely shown of Portuguese, Argentine people, Uruguayans, Mexicans, Cubans, Guatemalans, Panamanians, North American Indians, and Puerto Ricans are a mixed race people.
and many confuse them with the indigenous by claiming them to be as such and ignoring those of dark skin. The indigenous seed has been whited out and replaced with a lighter skinned mixed seed carbon copies of European father and a black indigenous mother. The other 11 tribes are still in Africa. Prophecy says that when the Messiah returns at the time of the Most High's wrath, he's going to gather his people, the other tribes, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, but Judah from the four corners of the earth. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, and from Egypt, and from Pathras, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, they shall spoil them of the east together, they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. He's going to gather his people, the other tribes, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, but Judah from the four corners of the earth. Here is Ethiopia, and as you can see, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia would be in the direction of all the places where the Negro was captured. Beyond the rivers of Ethiopia is where they are. Ethiopia is Kush, the land of Kush. If you check the Hebrew word for Ethiopia, it's Kush. And if you look at the ancient map of Kush, it covers modern Sudan and Egypt. Look at the rivers of Kush. It's the Nile River that flows all the way from Egypt to modern Ethiopia. What's beyond the rivers of Kush? The inner parts of Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Mali, Cameroon, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. If there are any true Israelites in China, Mexico, South America, Haiti, or India, they are Negroes. The tribe of Gad is South Africa. Listen to the prophecy in Genesis. Gad, a troop, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Genesis 49 verse 19. This is exactly what happened to the Zulu people of South Africa in 1879, an Anglo-Zulu war between the British Empire and the Zulu Kingdom. The British defeated the Zulus after a string of battles in South Africa. 
The Zulu Kingdom has been subjugated and the British leaders for over a hundred years until Nelson Mandela became the President of South Africa in 1994. This set off a chain of events that caused the descendants of the Zulus to completely gain total control of their country. They are now taking back farms, lands, businesses and whole corporations that are owned by whites. They have overcome the troop in these last days. No other black Negro nation on the planet has this testimony. The script also states, and I quote, And of Gad he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion, and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. End of quote. Deuteronomy 33 verse 20. Currently, the Zulus are the largest South African ethnic group with an estimated 10 to 11 million people. During Shaka Zulu's time, the Zulu nation grew rapidly to 2 million square miles consisting of 250,000 citizens and 40,000 soldiers. Notice the crown of the Zulu's head, a huge crown made of feathers. Look closely and you will see some very sharp huge horns which would, and I quote, teareth the arm with the crown of the head, end of quote, just like the scripture says. The American blacks are descendants of the tribe of Judah. Joel 3.6 offers a significant insight. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Leviticus 26.38 And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. Baruch chapter 2 verse 29 through 35 If ye will not hear my voice, surely this great multitude shall be turned into a small number among the nations where I will scatter them. For I knew that they would not hear me, because it is a stiff-necked people. But in the land of their captivities they shall remember themselves and shall know that I am the Lord their God. For I will give them an heart and ears to hear, and they shall praise me in the land of their captivity, and think upon my name, and return from their stiff neck, and from their wicked deeds. For they shall remember the way of their fathers, which sinned before the Lord. And I will bring them again into the land which I promised with an oath unto their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they shall be lords of it, and I will increase them, and they shall not be diminished, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them to be their God, and they shall be my people, and I will no more drive my people Israel out of the land that I have given them. The so-called Jews today did not wake up in the land of their slavery. They were not slaves in all the lands that they dwelt in. Not in Poland, not in Germany, not in Russia, not in America, and not in Spain. Even before the time of Hitler, they were not subject to slavery. Who and what people are still in the land of their captivity or slavery to this day? What people have had their heritage, language, and identity stripped to nothing? When the Most High through Yahshua gathers his people, they will still be in the land of their captivity or in the land of their slavery. And only then will he set up the millennial and make a covenant with his people. And there will be what? Peace in the Middle East when he comes and set up things. But what do you see now? Now that the so-called Jews are over in the land of Israel in the Middle East, what do you see? You see war and havoc. As a matter of fact, Israelites, or shall I say, as a matter of fact, Jews are now leaving the land of Israel because they believe it is unsafe to live there. Israel was created as the promised land to provide a home for all Jews of the world. But tens of thousands have fled the country over the past few years and more are lining up to leave. There is a passage in Psalms that only describes us and the movie Roots captured it very well. The passage that says, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. Now in the, in the movie Roots, 
The woman actually said, sing me one of those Negro spirituals. I wonder if you would favor us with one of those magnificent Negro spirituals. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Nobody knows the trouble I You know, the slave master used to have us singing and dancing for them all the time. And guess what, y'all? We still singing and dancing for their descendants. The slave master waxed rich through slavery, and their descendants inherited all the wealth. Europeans benefit greatly on a system built on slavery. The mistake they've made, to, just to, to deal with the racial part of this, is um, their boot has been on the necks of people of color since we began. Um, this is a nation founded on genocide and built, built on the backs of slaves. All right? um, so, so we started with a racial problem. We, want, we tried to el actually eliminate one entire race and then we used another race to build this country actually quite quickly as a new country into a world power. This country never would have had the wealth that it had had it not had slavery for a couple of hundred years. If it had had, if it, if it had, had to pay people, <laughs> they actually had to pay people to build America. You know, we, we might just be at uh, that point in Utah where we're joining the two rails together, maybe at this point right now. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet, Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be stink, instead of a girdle a rent, and instead of well-set hair baldness, and instead of a stomacher a girding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. Look at the daughters of Zion, the so-called black woman, walking about with your neck stretched and your feet and heels clanking about. Well, the Most High has put a punishment on the daughters of Zion because of this arrogancy, because of this haughtiness. He said, I'm going to smite your head with a scab and with baldness. That's why you see so many sisters who can't get their hair to grow. Their hair is weak and they have to wear wigs. There's a statement that the Most High makes about his people having his name. If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from them and forgive their sin near their land. This means that Yah's people are called by his name. Look at Jeremiah. Listen to what Jeremiah says here about the Father's name. And, and for the record, Jeremiah's name was not pronounced Jeremiah. It was actually pronounced Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, Jeremiah, he says, 
For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. So you ask yourself, well, Jeremiah, what does that mean? Well, Jeremiah in Hebrew means, Yah will rise. Wow. Who is Yah? Let me ask you this. What is the highest praise? Most of you know what the highest praise is. And you'll say hallelujah in a minute. Hallelujah is the highest praise. But what does hallelujah mean? Hallelujah means praise ye Yah. And for those of you who are still Christians, who is this Yah that you're saying praise to? That's the name of the Father, y'all. That is why so many of the Old Testament patrons and even those who came over here during the slave trade had the name Yah in their name. As a matter of fact, the Savior, the one who the world calls Jesus, his real name is Yahshua or Yahoshua, which means Yah is salvation. Look at some of the other names. You have Isaiah whose name was actually Yeshaya. His name means Yah has saved. Obadiah, which means serving Yah. Miriamiah, which means Yah comforted. Zephaniah, which means Yah has secreted. So their names contain the Father's name. There was no letter J 300 years ago. As a matter of fact, there's no letter J in the Hebrew alphabet. The letter J replaced the letter Y. So when you see these names, these names are actually praising the wonderful works of the Most High. One thing I find interesting is that most of our ancestors were named after the Father. You know, even our ancestors that came over here during the transatlantic slave trade, there's actually a website called slavevoyages.org. And if you look through the African Names database and type up the name Yah, Y-A-H, you will see that many of our ancestors had the name of the Father right there in their name. Another interesting fact to consider is that song, Kumbaya. Our ancestors used to sing that song, and it means, come by here, Yah. So, now ask yourself, why is it that we don't see the name Yah in the scriptures? How is it from cover to cover, you look through the scriptures, you don't see the name Yah? As a matter of fact, it's there. In Psalm 68.4, is the only verse that's actually where the, where the name is actually still there, but it's pronounced Jah in this passage. Let's look at the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary to see what the name Yah means. Yah, the sacred name of the Most High. The sacred name? You mean to tell me there's a sacred name of the Most High and we don't have it in the scriptures? Why isn't it in the scriptures? You gotta ask yourself, who would remove the name of Yah from the scriptures? Who would do such a thing? I mean, if it's the sacred name of the Most High, who in the world would remove this name from the scriptures, the translators, the scribes. They couldn't have been righteous, these people that translated the scriptures and they took the sacred name of the Most High out of the scriptures. You know, most of us bear the name of the slave master. The Most High took his name from us. And now we bear the names of those who captured us, those who killed us, tortured us, persecuted us. We walk around and we proudly wear the names Jones, Johnson, Smith, Banks, Taylor. You name it, we wear it. What's your name? Kunta. Kunta Kinte. <laughs> when the master gives you something, you take it. He gave you a name. It's a nice name. It's Toby. 
and it's going to be yours till the day you die. Now, I know you understand me, and I want to hear it. Again! <laughs> Toby. My name is Toby. Aye. That's a good nigger. All of the names and places of the scriptures have been changed to the European sounding names. So when you call these names now, you're not confessing these wonderful truths about the Most High. You're not confessing these truths. Even the Savior's name, which is Yahshua or Yahoshua, which means Yah is salvation or Yah has saved, you're not confessing that when you call on the name Jesus. You're not confessing anything when you call on the name Jesus. But when you call on the name Yahshua, you're saying Yah is salvation. Wow. Maybe that's why they took it out. But a lot of us are beginning to surname ourselves after our own heritage. You know, the scripture actually talks about that, how we would begin to call ourselves after the name of the Father, or Jacob, or Yisrael. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Sometimes truth is confused with hate, while hate is celebrated because of hypocrisy and willful ignorance. No one can deny the truth or override it because the truth will always be. What you have just witnessed is the uncovering of historical facts that have been whitewashed to create a false history of deception. Again, this is not hate speech because many have long viewed history through the eyes of deception without ever considering that to be hate speech. Now that the truth about black history is coming forth, we have been met with deflection and the utterings of those who claim that color doesn't matter. If the color or racial identity of our ancient ancestors didn't matter, why did the great deceivers recast them to look like themselves instead of the black skinned people they were? If the identity of the Israelites didn't matter, why was there a massive deceptive campaign to make them out to be white when they were indeed black people? Not tan, not modern day whitewashed Arabs, but black. This message is not anti-Semitic because we are the real Shemitic people, not those claiming to be. How can we be called anti-Semitic when we are the true Shemitic people? It doesn't matter how angry or upset folk get when the truth comes forth. It is what it is. Those that occupy the land of Israel today are Gentiles and not the biblical Israelites. Scripture clearly states that Jerusalem will be trodden down by Gentiles until their time is up and that the real Israelites would not be back in their land until the return of the Messiah. That's right, until he returns. It will be a simultaneous event according to scripture and not a half century or more after they supposedly reclaim the land. Another indicator was the fact that the real Israelites were to go back into the land from the lands of their captivities worldwide and would study war no more. Scripture said that the land would be as a garden of Eden before them, not war-torn and battle-written. The Messiah himself is going to gather his people. It won't be an ongoing conflict that is controlled by man as we have witnessed for decades now. The children of Israel are going to be returning from the great tribulation of their chastisement brought on by their own disobedience and the disobedience of their forefathers against the will of the Most High. 
They are going to be gathered from the land of their captivities and the lands of their enemies, wherewith they were made a base people and a ridiculed people. The curses that the scripture said would be upon them as a sign for the world to see will be lifted and they will be glorified. Now again, this is not hate speech, but it's recorded in scripture. Scripture also states that many Gentiles will cleave unto them at this time and will dwell in the land with them. In closing, don't be a willing participant in ignorance, which simply means you have made a conscious decision to ignore the truth. Your ignorance of the truth will not change the facts, neither will it excuse you from the consequences of rejecting knowledge. Don't be a part of the strong delusion. Join us on the narrow road by escaping the broad road to perdition in which many will travel this road to their destruction. Although the human landscape has changed and conquest has brought about new faces worldwide, the fact still remains that the indigenous people worldwide were black and that truth can no longer be denied. Shalom, family. This is truth music, the truth movement. Truth movement. Yo, we've been a part of the biggest conspiracy the planet has ever known, man. You ever wonder why everybody seems to hate us? Everywhere we go, seems like everybody hate us. The world is against us. We gon' bring y'all some light, you know what I mean? Check it out. It's been a long time, but we waking up so many. Lies we told, we breaking up so many Locked up so many, shot down You can't keep to the permitted crown Try to hold us, try to break us Take our names away, but couldn't shake us now I pray to the most high with all your might What a feeling, y'all, we the Israelites Lie to us, Christians lie to us Read the Bible, the history is tied to us Nobody ride for us, Messiah died for us Ask the saints them cry for us at last the truth has finally come out we the people of the bible this is no doubt can these bones live i am living proof and baffled why my people hate the truth false religions false idols false titles this is truth music not elementary recitals feel this y'all get close to the speaker the world strengthens me when i'm feeling weaker let it sink down deep deep into your mental truth get so hot it overheat instrumentals we from the big cities plus the big lights what a feeling y'all we the israelites long time but we waking up so many lies we told we waking up so many locked up so many shot down you can't keep to the permitted crown try to hold us try to break us take our names away but couldn't shake us now I pray to the most high with all your might what a feeling y'all we the israelites Close your eyes. 400 years of slavery, the same people had a lifetime full of bravery, hung in trees just like the savior, had to pick up the pen and put the truth down on paper, and if you don't believe me, check out the script, Deuteronomy 28 and 68, that's the tip on who was brung to the US on slave ships, learn real history, not these BS heretics, governments, politicians, making satanic decisions, Walt Disney, turning kids into magicians, but now, truth is coming out in these last days, put the strong drink down and throw away your haze plagues don't worry the most high will bring them you want to know whose address is on the kingdom we from the big cities plus the big lies what a feeling y'all we the israelites no time but we waking up so many lies we told we waking up so many locked up so many shot down you can't keep to the permitted crown try to hold us try to break us take our names away
Messiah, follow the Messiah.